Hey everybody, so I've got Ryan Tierney here of Seeding Matters um, and Ryan was somebody who was put in contact with me um, a few years ago, somebody who told me you have to see this facility in Lemon Valley in County Derry, it's incredible what they're doing out there and so Ryan, you gave me an introduction to, introduction to what Lean is actually through seeing your factory um, with Seeding Matters and so I'd love if you'd just tell us a bit about yourself, a bit about the company and how you came to embrace the lean culture. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Declan, and thanks for having me today. It's uh, brilliant to, to catch up and uh, good to get the time to do this. So yeah, our, our lean journey began four and a half years ago, actually. And uh, one night I was uh, sitting at home, actually very stressed. Um, there was lots of problems uh, in, the, in the company. It just wasn't running the way we wanted it to run. Uh, we, we manufacture specialist seating for hospitals and nursing homes. And uh, it's myself and my two brothers who own uh, the company. And I'm mainly on the operational manufacturing side. Mm -hmm. And things, things were struggling. It, it, it was a, a very difficult factory to run. Lots of bespoke adaptations. Um, and it was pretty tough going mm -hmm. and I just got to a point where I said there has to be a better way and I was sitting on my kitchen table one night just on YouTube and I typed in like how to organize a factory how to run a factory all this type of stuff and uh, lo and behold I came across uh, Paul Akers mm -hmm. from ASCAP and I'm not exaggerating I sat up all night <laughs> and watched his videos over and over and over I, I didn't go to bed I sat up all night most that, people would binge on Netflix, but you were binging on lean manufacturing I, videos. <laughs> that's right. But it, it was just a, a light bulb moment for me. I, I couldn't understand how a company could run at this level. Mm. It was just operational excellence at a really high level, and it really got me excited. Mm. Mm. So how do you go from there to... Like, I couldn't believe it, honestly, when I went in to see it matters, just how well organized the factory was. And, and that morning meeting at half, half eight in the morning, I thought a lot of companies would struggle to get their employees to come in a half an hour kind of earlier, let's say, than the, the typical working day um, yeah. and do it with a smile on their face. So, like, how has it come from being at your, your kitchen table to building something like such so special? Yeah. So we started very, very small. Uh, I came in the, the next day really excited. Uh, about what I had seen on uh, Paul Aker's YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of two-second lean, so where every single person in the company makes a two-second lean improvement every day before they start work. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is to have small incremental improvements, but to do it every day. And it started really small. We are on a morning meeting with uh, three or four or five people, and the meeting developed, got bigger and bigger, and eventually everyone attended the meeting. They were sort of wanted to find out what was happening. So we didn't make it mandatory at the start. We just, uh, it was very relaxed. We made a few improvements and people started catching on and thinking, actually, there, there's something happening here. I see yeah. Deggy's area over there and it, it looks totally different. What, what's he doing? Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, every single person became uh, on board with it. Brilliant. And, and can you give us an example, I, I suppose, in, in layman's terms, because I know your products are very bespoke, right? But to, to someone like me who's, who's not plugged into sort of a, a factory production line environment, like what would a two, two second improvement be? Yeah. So re really what, what lean is, uh, lean, lean is continuous improvement. You can call it lean or call it continuous improvement, everything getting better every day. And really what, what lean does, it, it takes a process. If you look at any, any process, uh, making a cup of tea, uh, making your bed, uh, getting the gym ready for a, for a session, every single uh, thing we do in life is a process. Mm -hmm. And all lean manufacturing does is looks at that process from start to finish and extracts the non-value added activities out of that process. Mm -hmm. So lean can be applied as much uh, in a factory setting as it can in a gym, uh, at school. It can, can be applied anywhere. So a typical two second lean improvement for our assembly area in the factory, maybe mm -hmm. having the drill right beside you. 
So when you need to drill that hole, bang, it's there. It's right there. It's labeled. It's color coded. It's in a place. And it sounds so simple. Mm. But imagine doing one of those improvements every single day. Mm. Mm. Imagine then doing it with every single person in the company. It's, yeah. it's really exciting. I'm even thinking of the, the man drawer that I have here in my apartment where you put all your bits and bobs, you know, and I would struggle yeah. to find it. So I could probably benefit of that kind of label. And um, I suppose some people would be looking at this and thinking, God, do you not run out of two second improvements after four years? Yeah. <laughs> we, we do uh, tours uh, from companies that they come from all over the world to see our, our factory. And I think that's one of the most common questions we get asked. Do you, mm. do you not run out of improvements? But uh, the, the more you understand lean manufacturing and the more that you see waste, so we always say we're running about with waste goggles. We just, we just can't unsee waste. Yes. The more you, you understand what waste is, the more improvements you see, not, not less. Mm. So uh, people think waste is the stuff you see sitting in the bin, and it is waste as well, but yeah. it's not the only waste. And there's actually, there's actually eight wastes. And what, once you... Uh, train yourself and train your your people to see waste at this high level there is no end to the improvements you can make mm. could you tell us a little bit about those eight is it something you can you can yeah. expand on a little yeah so all nearly all waste starts with overproduction it's one of our biggest flaws as, as, a, as a human being is ordering too much stuff buying too much stuff so we, we, we order too much stuff we overproduce so that's the first waste then the next thing we do, I'll give you an example. Uh, before Lean, we ordered uh, brochures, sales brochures for, mm. for the, our company. We ordered far, far too many. Uh, so we overproduced. Mm. The next waste then is transportation. We had to transport them from the supplier to our racks in the factory. We then transported them from there down to another area. We had to redo that area. So we ended up moving them all again. So mm. all this waste that transportation that that's the second waste mm -hmm. uh, the next thing that happens nearly always when you when you buy too much stuff you transport it then you've got a defect so what happens when you get a leak in the roof the brochures get defected you've mm -hmm. got all the, these defects and what you end up doing then is reworking all the defects so mm -hmm. that's the process and that's the fourth waste then when you've over processed you use wasted motion um, mm -hmm. the customer is then waiting on their brochure they haven't got it because we bought too many mm -hmm. we transported it we had a defect we had to over process so now they're waiting on their brochure which they can't get mm -hmm. and as we're doing all those wastes the, the next waste and the most i would say the most deadly waste is the waste of uh, employee potential or skills mm -hmm. so while we're doing all this what we call uh, non-value added activity our people aren't using their skills. They're not doing what they're paid to do. So the, the, these are the eight wastes. It's really interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking from also from say the, the human standpoint outside of work. And I don't know, is this, is, is this on the human, is the blame with the human being here? But you know, I say as a, as a single person going to buy a packet of lettuce, it sounds like a silly example, but yeah. they don't generally sell them in one person portions, right? So it's, um, you know, you, you end up buying too much and then not, it, it ends up getting wasted because you don't use it up on time or whatever else, or maybe you force yourself to eat it, which is another form of waste that, that yes. I've noticed from working in the health and wellness industry, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to follow on with that. So um, I, I had kind of a question on, so like the three sort of biggest wins that you've noticed from embracing this this lean culture and maybe because you mentioned the employees if you include uh one of the examples of how your employees have come on but also just in terms of the factory and, and that yeah so i i would say that the biggest probably uh benefit to to uh lean for from a employee's perspective mm -hmm. is ownership you know, you, you walk in their company, you, you've been here and you see smiles yeah. in everyone, everyone's faces. Mm -hmm. They're really happy and excited to be at work. Yeah. And that, that's not a common thing in a lot of companies out there. Um, we have the most amazing team of people here at Seat Matters. And they're, they're, they're actually so excited about their work because they're hired as a process engineer. 
And the, the, this is the difference between someone operating in a lean culture and a normal everyday company. Yeah. So everyone is hired as a process engineer. Mm -hmm. You're hired to improve the process of manufacturing the chair. You're not paid to, to manufacture the chair. So mm -hmm. this is a totally different mindset. It's a totally different thinking yeah. because everyone's coming in in the morning and saying, how can I improve my work area? How can I make my job easier? And when they're thinking at this level, it's, it's, a higher, it's a higher level of thought because the work is actually easy. And when people are engaged in this type of thinking, they're, they're challenging themselves, they're, uh, they're using their brain, they're, they're, they're much more empowered. So definitely empowerment is a, is a massive one, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I liked even the, subtle, the subtlety of the actual job title, right? Because being a process engineer means that you're not coming to work to go through the motions or to be the spoke in a wheel, right? Just to do your job and sort of very tunnel vision. It's, it's about thinking outside the box as well. Exactly. It is, yeah. Definitely is. Love it. And so what other examples, like, um, even could you chat to us a little bit? Because I loved, uh, I liked the, the morning meeting and also just the ownership of the cleaning process. I thought that they're two things that I'd, I'd love yeah. to get you to chat about a bit. Yeah, so our, our day starts with a morning meeting. We've actually changed it since you were here. So we, we start with the meeting now. So at 7.55, every single person in the company gathers up in, in the meeting area and we hold a meeting. And a different person holds a meeting every single day. It rotates by alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. And the, the purpose of this, to go back to the why, to, to start with why, that the purpose of this is that lean is a tool for growing and developing people. Yeah. So a lot of the time people see lean as a tool for to increase an efficiency or to increase profits or all this type of thing. And, and it does, but that's actually a byproduct. Mm. because the center of, of lean, the center of TPS, the, this thinking that came from Japan, is to grow and develop people and give them the freedom to continuously improve and engage their brains. Mm. And if you do that, everything else comes as a byproduct. So the morning meeting is the first thing we start with mm -hmm. uh, every day. And the morning meeting always starts with uh, stretches, first of all just to get everyone uh, listened up, which everyone enjoys. Then we get straight into the meeting and the first slide is gratefuls. So three or four people are selected to call out what they're grateful for. Oh, and nice. it, it could be anything. It could be, I'm grateful for my car, it got me to work today. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful for my childminder who uh, looked after my kids last night. I'm grateful for, it's just whatever they feel grateful for. Mm -hmm. Because when we start the meeting on that positive note, it changes the energy of the whole day. And okay. it's really, really powerful. Mm. So we, we, yeah, so it's, it's an amazing start to the day. Yeah. But that's not it. It goes on from there, right? It does, yeah. So after that, we, we review our improvement opportunities. And again, it's, it's very subtle, the, the, the change there. Most companies call them mistakes or defects. We call it an improvement opportunity. So we review those every day. And, and just as a, as a side note, if someone makes uh, a defect or what you would call a mistake, the first thing we say is, good, brilliant. How can we make this better? How can we make an improvement so that it doesn't happen again? Mm. The person who creates the defect or mistake is actively involved in making the improvement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a culture that embraces that there's, there's not the shame around it, let's say. Yes, that's right. So really what we're trying, what we're trying to do is create a blame free, but problem aware culture. Mm -hmm. that, that's our key blame free, but problem aware. So we're, we're aware that there is problems, but it's not about attacking the person. It's about yeah. uh, making the improvement. So the, the, the next stage of our meeting then is who is on toilet duty today, who is on kitchen duty today. And again, the, the thinking behind all this is that we have very little hierarchy in the company. Everyone is at the same level. We're all here to serve the customer. It doesn't matter if you're processing orders in the office, if, you, if you're doing the accounts, or if you're upholstering a chair, everyone is the same. 
we all dress the same with no shirts and ties it's all just t-shirts and and zip up jackets we keep everything yeah. nice and and, and uh, simple yeah. but the, the thinking again with every single person doing kitchen duty and toilet duty is to create that level of respect through the whole organization yeah. because if me and jonathan and martin my two brothers if it's our turn to do toilet duty and kitchen duty and people see us doing that well then there's no reason any anybody else can do it yeah so, excellent uh, can I ask you, did you get any resistance like on a few things, so kitchen and toilet duty, but also because you mentioned it goes alphabetically, so I suppose nobody really gets the chance to duck out of leading the meeting. No, they, they don't. No. And okay. at, at the start, we, we embraced everything very, very slowly. Um, our father always talked about the sheepdog approach. So mm -hmm. if you watch a, a sheepdog rounding up sheep, it goes away around the side of the field and slowly but surely the next thing you know the sheep are in the pen mm. um, as opposed to a bulldog uh, scenario where it goes in and splits all the sheep up so we, we like to work very slowly and, and quietly and confidently but working towards a goal so at the start not everybody wanted to do the meeting and, and that was okay so a few people volunteered to, do, to hold the meetings and to do kitchen duty and to do bathroom duty Mm -hmm. Then more people done it and more people done it until it got to a point where it was just, it was normal activity. Yeah, it's the culture. It's the culture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so to take it from the business environment into a health and wellness environment, because I think there'll be certain uh, clients of mine and, and people say on my, my email list who are into all things health and wellness. And I know Paul Akers has the, the Lean Health book, yep. which I read and uh, on your recommendation, actually, and it was brilliant. So. For you, like, what are two to three things that, that have benefited you from adopting a lean culture outside of the, the workplace for your own sort of health and wellness? Yeah. So the, the first thing I would say is that lean, it's not necessarily lean manufacturing. Um, it's lean thinking. Mm. And th this thinking came from uh, Toyota in, in Japan uh, about 80, 85 years ago. So that, that's how long this, this, uh, this thinking has been around. Mm -hmm. And it's often called TPS, the Toyota Production System, or the, or the Thinking People System, TPS. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's a thinking people system because it's a way of thinking. It's, it's, lean is a mindset. It's a mindset that every single thing in your life, whether at work, at home, with your hobbies, with, in relationships, everything gets incrementally better every day. And it's, an, it's a fantastic way to think, mm -hmm. to think that things are just, just a bit better, just a bit better than yesterday. That's all we need, not, not huge gains, just incrementally better. So outside of work, uh, I, I play the piano. So I, I try to play the piano two or three evenings a week. And I just need to get a bit better and learn a new chord or a new note or a new song, just incrementally better. I'm not trying to get up here in a year but just this feeling that everything can get incrementally better is an amazing concept so definitely playing the piano with the running i enjoy running mm -hmm. so uh i've got an app and it's called my uh my fitness, fitness pal yeah fitness pal yeah, yeah. So but that and i'm always trying to incrementally increase speed and, and distance and it's just a way of thinking again it, it works as, as much for running as it does for manufacturing a chair. Nice. I'm thinking it's actually probably map my run if I'm right because I my map fitness my pal, yeah it. yeah my map fitness my pal is for nutrition yeah. Uh, okay, great. And actually, so I was interested. This is more from a selfish perspective because I'd love to set up my own gym someday. You know, for a modest place to start off with. And yeah. I was thinking, I, I could when I met up with you guys, I was like, this is highly applicable to a gym, right? And and I, I, it's in the back of my mind. I haven't given it a lot of thought, but I know that you could create probably a fantastic lean culture yeah. in the gym. Um, but I'm just wondering, do you, would you have any thoughts on that? Because it's a different dynamic in a sense of if you're, say, an instructor and it's actually employees coming from, or not employees, clients coming from outside to, to uh, avail of a service, you know, to, uh, to a place. Is there certain things you'd be looking out for if you were setting up a gym or like certain lean thinking you'd adapt in that scenario? 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Physically, uh, for a start, there's there's lots of things you could do mm -hmm. if if you were setting up a gym. E even in terms of uh, flexibility, flexibility is a massive, massive concept. We spent a full week at our meetings uh, doing a learning on uh, flexibility. So it's basically having things on wheels. So your gym equipment on wheels, uh, put, uh, signboards on wheels, uh, everything flexible so you can really change the layout uh, within a few seconds. Mm. So when you were here, uh, I remember showing you all, all our workbenches are on wheels, our band saws are on wheels, our notice boards are on wheels, our desks in the office are on wheels. Yeah. So we can make a change really quick mm. because what most people do when they set up a, a new company or, a, or a, an office setting or a gym, everything's fixed mm -hmm. and it's very hard to change. But if, if you build in flexibility into the process, it's a huge benefit for making in, uh, improvements and changes down the line. And th this idea of flexibility isn't just for physical equipment. Flexibility also transfers through to the employees or the people you're working with. So we want our people to be flexible. So today you may be working in this area, but you want to be flexible enough that you can move to another area if the yeah. customer demand changes. Because all we're doing is, uh, as lean practitioners, is serving the customer, mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to serve the customer better. So as our customer demand changes, we need to be able to adapt our workspace we need to be able to adapt our people. We need to be able to adapt our marketing. Everything must be fluid and flexible um, for, for us to, to meet the needs of the customer. So there's, there's lots of stuff you could do if you're setting up a new gym, definitely. That's yeah. it's really exciting, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's highly, that's an interesting point to make because I've had to move gym equipment in the commercial gym that I was working at with other trainers, and we were moving bits of equipment, and, geez, you could... You could hurt yourself easily enough if you didn't know what you were doing, you know. And and actually, none of that was on was on wheels. So you'd need to, yeah. But there, there's something there, kind of in my mind, thinking there could be there could be good opportunity there in terms of the equipment that you bring in in the first place, and also, yeah, and also how you plan on on positioning that. Um, and you actually yeah. triggered you triggered a question in my mind there about the customer because, so so the whole approach is is centered around so i i, I missed you. you you kind of put it nicely there but it's centered around getting a good getting the best service possible over to the customer but also yeah. at the same time it's centered around getting the best out of your people but i'm just wondering how how um how much did you involve the customers in this new sort of lean approach like how did you actually do questionnaires with them and actually kind of really delve in like what exactly do you need guys what are you judging us on or was that already there or it, it's something we were actually always pretty good at was getting feedback from the customer yeah but in, internally our internal systems weren't at the level they needed to be so it was about bringing our internal systems up to the level of of uh of our customer service, it, it, was all, it was always pretty pretty good. But one thing that we do is bring our customers to visit our, our facility, visit our factory. Mm. And when they see, when they witness our morning meeting, when they engage with their people and see that this isn't just a, a front or something that's on YouTube that's, that's fake or, or made up, it's actually real. And when you come and you experience this, this real strong sense that we are here to serve the customer, it's not just writing on the wall or, or uh, text on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, on that, like, I, so there's exciting times in terms of your company at the minute because you're, you're expanding. Yeah. Can you we tell are, us yeah. a wee bit about it? Yeah, it's actually very exciting, actually. Um, myself and my two brothers, uh, we like to. Uh, keep ourselves busy. Um, uh -huh. so I got that impression from you, all right. <laughs> you know, so just just ten ten and a half weeks ago today, actually, we decided to set up a new company. Um, based on everything that's going on uh, around the world, we've seen uh, a huge need for medical face masks, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we thought this is it's definitely going to be uh, going to be around for a while. Yeah. Uh, there was a very definite need locally and internationally 
for uh, for face masks, and we decided to um, set up a company dedicated to manufacturing face masks right here in Northern Ireland. Oh wow, excellent! So within ten, within eight weeks from scratch, and this is uh, this is an unbelievable story. Actually, within eight weeks from start to finish, we built a brand new factory. We set up a marketing system and a marketing team. We sourced machineries, machinery. We we sourced supplies. We got all the correct standards. We really focused and got a team on this. And within ten weeks, uh, we're in production. Incredible! Wow, that's and, and I know you're saying leans about doing things sort of slowly, but I'd imagine there was a few late nights this last ten weeks, you no, know, to get all that pulled together. There was. There definitely was. Yeah. So it's it's, it's unbelievable that the the amount of work that we've got done in the last eight to 10 weeks. And it's all using lean principles. We just reduced the waste, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, took out all the non-value added activities and increased the value. And it shows what you can do with this type of thinking. So it's amazing. And can I ask, is there anywhere we can find out more information about it, a website or? Yeah, if you look at Paragon Health, I just actually got a, a box beside me. So this is our, this is our mask box here. So type to our uh, medical, uh, great face masks uh, manufactured in, in Northern Ireland. Great. Well, I'll put a link in just for people to, under the video here, I'll put a link for people to find that. Brilliant, yeah. Excellent. Okay, geez, ex exciting times all around. Now, um, I, I, I know you're a busy man, so I've got a couple of questions that I always like to ask people because, as you know, my concept is performance trainer, helping people unlock their potential through, through mind, body, and soul. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, like, what's the best bit of performance advice, Ryan, that you feel you've received in, in your lifetime? Okay, the best performance advice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So uh, about 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago now, before we set up uh, Seating Matters, uh, I was 19. My brother, um, Martin was 18. I was 19. And Jonathan was 20. So we were quite young. Mm. And we watched a movie called The Secret. I'm not sure, sure if you've ever heard of The Secret. So we, we watched a movie called The Secret, and there was a guy in it called Bob Proctor. So we started looking up Bob Proctor and read a few of his books and watched a few of his videos. And we actually decided to go and meet him. He was doing a seminar in Toronto. Oh, wow. And we got on the plane. We, didn't, we hadn't even started the company, but we had an idea that we were going to do it. We got on the plane and we went to visit him. And we actually ended up spending three days with him. And we got engaged with him so much that we ended up going to his house. And he, he invited us to his home in Toronto. And we spent a full day there. But he coached us one-on-one -on -one because he, he seen potential. He seen something, something special. We were talking about, you know, we're thinking of manufacturing chairs and this type of thing, supplying hospitals and nursing homes all over the world. Mm. He said, "There's really only four things you need to know if you wanna, if you have a goal, if you wanna achieve something, and and only four. And these four things have stuck in my head for the last eleven years." Mm -hmm. He said, "Number one is decide what you want." And he said, "Most people don't do that. Most people don't really know what they want. They have a vague plan of what direction they're going in, but they're not de definite on on what they want." Number one, decide what you want. Number two, decide what you're prepared to give up to get it. Mm -hmm. Number three, set your mind to it. And number four, get on with the work. Mm -hmm. And these four things stuck in my head and, and I never forgot it. Because a lot of people have decided what they want. Yep, I want X, Y, and Z. I want to get to this level. Number two, decide what you're prepared to give up to get it. Oh no, I want this, but I'm not prepared to give up my Saturdays or I'm not prepared to give up my two holidays a year, mm. or I'm not prepared to be home late. I need to be home for six o'clock. So they, they decide what they want, but they're not prepared to give up mm. something to get there. Yeah. Other people decide what they want. They decide what they're prepared to give up to get there. They set their mind to it, but they don't take action. They don't do number four. So it takes all four, and it's really stuck in my head, and it's, it's an amazing concept. And, yeah. and I've seen that with, with a lot of people. God, thanks a million. That's excellent. And like, I love it because it's a very simple approach as well, you know, but it's, 
Yeah. Very true. And I hope people watching in will really take something from that because I think it's uh, I think it's important. And then to to wrap up, I want to ask you a question just because I know it's not all smooth sailing, even if you're very sure on your direction and, and what you want to do, there's snags along the road. So I wanted to ask you just about a time that you've come across adversity in your life and what you learned from it. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say that the recent, the, the recent uh, pandemic that, that we're all going through at the minute, uh, three months ago was a tough time for our company. Uh, as it was a, a lot of companies, um, because of the, because of the nature of our business, we have to physically go and visit hospitals, nursing homes, care facilities to to demonstrate our products. And for three months, we weren't allowed to do that. So, needless to say, the following three months ended up with a large reduction in sales, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it actually, for the first time in, in eleven years, it got it got scary, mm -hmm. and. There was two options. We could either sit it out, see what happens, or pivot and try and change. And at that point where we were at the lowest point probably in our business for a good few years, we decided to uh, start our new company and make the face masks. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not what happens, it's how you deal with what happens. And I think that's it's an important lesson. And out of, out of uh, probably one of the lowest points came something which is actually going to be one of one of our, our, our highest highs yeah. and it's setting up this new company because there's always a, a quote that sticks in my head and it says that tough times don't last but tough people do mm -hmm. so if you're tough you'll you always get there you'll make out yeah yeah, excellent. God, Ryan, like there's so much wisdom there for people. So um, yeah, I'm very excited to to um, yeah to share this. And I'm just wondering, is there any more details you can give us just about Seaton Matters and that where we can find you and and just find out more about the company and 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 Lean? Yeah. So I've actually got my own YouTube channel as well. So Ryan Tierney, Lean Made Simple. If you type mm -hmm. in uh, that into YouTube. You can see uh, all of our improvement videos and you'll see a lot of videos there uh, to do with our, our uh, culture as well and how we operate here yeah. because it is, it is very different. And uh, sometimes people, they, they see this stuff in YouTube and think that it can't be like that or it's not real, but uh, you, you've seen yourself that it's, it's very real and yeah, um, yeah it's, it's all good. Brilliant. Uh, absolutely. I, I And I'll put the link into that as well. I know I couldn't. Yeah, I've, I've already talked about the company and, and how it's special. So definitely for people to get a flavor for that, they should definitely have a look at the, um, at the YouTube uh, channel. So that's, yeah. that's great. Look, Ryan, thanks a million for taking the time to chat. No problem. Uh, Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. It's the first, <laughs> yeah, it's the first podcast I'm running uh, officially. So uh, congratulations. You're the man I wanted to launch it with. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers.